there again. You're watching ESD TV. Now, one of the most important things to come out of these EASD meetings are the consensus reports. And this year, it's on hyperglycemia. And to talk us through the report, its methodology and its outcomes, which I know is of enormous interest to many of you watching, uh, can I introduce you to Earl Hirsch from the University of Washington, uh, Gian Paolo Fadini from the University of Padua, and Keitan Dattaria from uh, Norwich, and that's in the UK. And let's come to you first of all. Um, uh, tell me, what did you do? How did this come about? What was the methodology? Well, this was a tremendous effort from multiple organizations. There were eight of us who um, reviewed everything regarding not just ketoacidosis, but also hyperosmolar syndrome, HHS. Um, from the American Diabetes Association point of view, there has not been an update in the review of this since 2009. Um, and this was important because it's now putting all of these organizations around the world on the same page. We looked at the incidents prevalence of hyperosmolar syndrome and DKA. And it's been very interesting because our best data comes up just before the COVID epidemic. And, you know, we can speculate about that, but we're going to really have to wait for those details. But what we've seen around the world has been this um, increase in the amount of hyperglycemic emergency and then a plateauing and a decrease. But what's been interesting about this is that it is somewhat country specific in terms of what we've seen. And what's extremely interesting to me is how the management of this differs between countries. For example, we've seen this increase in the US, but a decrease in the length of stay. Whereas my colleague Keaton in the UK um, the length of stay is longer with, a, uh, with not this increase in the incidence. And so from an economic point of view, um, even though we didn't have a specific economic analysis, it looks like some of this may wash out. I should point out that the mortality remains quite low, which is, which is a good thing, but any mortality is too high. And um, I think that the big thing that we will see from the consensus is some of the changing of the definitions of what we consider hyperglycemic emergency. I think the biggest single thing that has changed over the last decade or so has been the emergence of euglycemic ketoacidosis related to the SGLT2 inhibitors and other things, but this is certainly um, on the front of the mind of most clinicians who care for people with diabetes. And that's in type 1, isn't it? Yes. Well, it can be in any kind of yes. diabetes, yes. But with, with the worry with of, the, of SGLT2 inhibitors... It's a, it's a good that, question. It can be in type... You, one can't see this in type 2 diabetes in yeah. certain situations. Yeah. I've actually become interested in atypical diabetes, which mm -hmm. is neither type 1 nor type 2. You can see it in that also. And um, I've seen it myself. And so it's that little gray area and people perhaps misdiagnosed. They go in thinking they're type two and actually they're type one. Yes, there, there's another entity um, in Seattle. We don't see much ketosis prone diabetes. We see in other parts of the country with a certain ethnic minorities in the United States. And um, in that situation, we see a lot of ketoacidosis, which is not type one. Take us through some of the main findings from your point of view. What was particularly stood out for you and what would you like the people who are watching to know? Well, starting from Earth's words, I think that one of the novelty that we have to underline is the changes in the definition of uh, DKA, which does not have uh, a glucose threshold any longer in order to acknowledge the existence of this euglycemic, um, so-called euglycemic, ketoacidosis in people with diabetes that is not only SGLT2 inhibitor induced, 
uh, or not only in type 1, but also in type 2, and to acknowledge that uh, glucose levels can be relatively low in these patients. Um, we have changed a little bit the definition, and this is one of the novelty that uh, that's important to highlight. It's been an enormous effort to put together all this data, um, and what we realized is that sometimes the quality of the evidence uh, that we could gather is not so high because we are missing randomized controlled studies, that is the studies that provide the highest level of quality of, of data, the highest quality data. Um, and so it is, we, we end up with a consensus, with an expert consensus sometimes about the treatment strategies, uh, the transition of care uh, from the in hospital to the uh, uh, discharge therapy. These are important points that the people I think want to know and so we're trying also to give some directions for the future work, for the future studies that we need that we are eagerly missing. So hopefully in the next few years, there will be new evidence coming out that will enable us to update again this document and uh, provide or confirm what we suggest or provide new recommendations. So Kate, and take us through the, um, you know, the, the different strategies in the different uh, countries in terms of, of, of tr treatment, because you're a, you're a frontline clinician, aren't you? I am a frontline clinician, yes. So I think that, as Earl said earlier on, and as you mentioned, that, that it's been treated in different ways in different countries, and uh, there have been different strategies. So one of the things that have been, has been done is that in the uh, previous version of the US document and, and in the current version, it, it, people have been divided into whether they've had mild DKA or moderate or severe because it makes a difference as to how people are treated so, and particularly if, if you if you live in a part of the world where you have to tr pay for your own treatment you don't want to be admitted into hospital so if you've got mild DKA for example you can be treated with regular subcutaneous insulin in the emergency room and you could be hopefully get better there Whereas in somewhere like Europe or in the UK, for example, anybody with DK is admitted into hospital and has intravenous insulin. So there are, there are different strategies. And what we've tried to do is allow for wherever you live in the world that you could have a strategy that fit a treatment regimen that can suit you, whatever the facilities people have. Um, so to try and to ensure that this is a truly global document. And it suits the systems as well. Correct. Yes. Yes, because yeah, the systems are so different, aren't exactly. they? Exactly. But the, the condition, you know, we need, everybody needs fluids, everybody needs insulin. Most people need some minerals called potassium. Uh, and therefore, we try to provide a, a, a framework around which people can give the insulin, the fluids and the potassium, whichever system you work in, whatever uh, uh, facilities you have, that you can, uh, you can treat them appropriately. Um, what else would you like to draw out for particularly for uh, attention? Oh. You know, one of the things that happens where I live is adult onset type 1 diabetes. We know that half of new onset type 1 now occurs in adults. That's very different than when I was a medical student. And the misdiagnosis of adults to type 2 diabetes when they're type 1 and they're put on metformin, they're put on an SGLT2 inhibitor, you are looking at um, you know, a potential disaster of a ketoacidosis and a lactic acidosis. I've seen it way too many times. And if I could say one thing to my primary care colleagues is don't forget about type 1 diabetes in adults because these people do end up in ketoacidosis many times. Dan Paolo. I would like to stress a little bit the transition to discharge um, and the prevention of recurrence because DKA today has a very low mortality, as Erd mentioned, uh, but uh, mortality is increased in those who have a recurrence within 30 days or within the calendar year. So we should be well aware of the risk factors for recurrence that these patients who have multiple episodes of DKA uh, in the same year, for example, because this increases a lot uh, their mortality. And so we should be uh, carefully monitoring these patients after discharge, identifying the causes of the DKA and 
uh, perform re-education, refreshing education on insulin injection, on blood glucose control, maybe providing them with more advanced or sophisticated ways of checking their glucose or checking their blood ketones. So um, it's very important to be aware also that social determinants of health to get today are really considered drivers of DKA or drivers of protection against these hyperglycemic crises. So they need to be addressed in a comprehensive way, not looking only to treatment, to insulin, potassium, whatever else, but also to these important social determinants of health in order to improve the outcome and prevent recurrence. And that, I guess, is a big difference between 10 years ago and now. The social determinants of health, we are so much more aware, absolutely rightly, of the social determinants of health and how they play into uh, these uh, chronic uh, conditions. Um, Kaysen, anything else that you want to highlight? I would actually highlight something that Gian Paolo said, is that there are gaps in what we know. Because of, we've worked uh, quite hard over the last couple of years, we've looked at you know hundreds of uh, manuscripts and papers of, on this, but there are still big gaps. Uh, and one For of instance? The, uh, well, for example, um, one of the things that we have advocated or at least said is that you could continue basal insulin at the same time as intravenous insulin. Now, there, there, is lit, the, there are arguments on both sides. Some people say no, some people say yes. So there's not a huge amount of information around that. So we said, well, because there isn't a huge amount of information, you can consider it. So uh, there are gaps. That's one example. I think that one of the things that we've not had in the past is that because there have been different definitions used around the world, and indeed some of the pharmaceutical companies have also used different definitions when they've looked at things, if we have a unified definition, it allows people to compare across studies, compare across different uh, data sets, for example, to actually come up with a unified answer and not say, well, they didn't do that, they didn't do it right, so we can't use their data. So actually, I think one of the big advantages is in unifying um, the definitions for both DK and HHS, it allows comparisons. And when we're talking about the same thing, we're all talking from the same shame sheet and talking about the same thing, which is actually quite, you know, going to be a new thing, which I hope is going to really help us understand what we need to do in the future. And that's the power, really, of these consensus reports, isn't it? That it gets everybody singing from the same song sheet. And actually, you then stop, you know, replication of, of, of work and not being able to use studies, for instance, because they've used different definitions. Correct. Absolutely. Mm. So next steps, you are all going to turn into, I guess, influencers. <laughs> You're going to be out there on social media doing your influencing stuff. I mean, th there is a lot to do once you've done a consensus report, isn't there? Because you really need to get it out there. So what will you all be doing? Well, I, I think, you know, given in the corner of the United States that I live, um, I see at the community hospitals in particular, I see a lot of mistakes made and um, at least not so much on the social media since I'm not big on social media, but at least locally in my community, in my state, I really want to get the word out. We see so much DKA. We see so many people who are readmitted because they're discharged too soon. They're discharged um, continuing on their SGLT2 inhibitors, for example. They're discharged with the wrong diagnosis, the things that we've talked about. Um, we see a lot of mistakes. I can tell you in the rural part of uh, where I live, Montana, Idaho, and Washington, um, where they don't see a lot of DKA, and when patients come in, it may have been 10, 20 plus years since they've treated it. Wow. And I think what this consensus does is for that part of rural America and probably the entire world, this consensus is going to get these um, uh, primary care and emergency room physicians who see so little of this, it's going to get them to think about it again. So when these patients do come in, they're familiar because things have changed since they were medical students training to do this. And, and actually, the patient groups have a very important role here because, yes, you can get it out, these consensus reports out through your professional networks. Of course you can. But actually, the patient networks are really becoming more and more valuable in terms of distributing this kind of consensus. 
It's absolutely right. So we, we want to involve everybody. So, you know, the people with diabetes themselves are equal advocates for making sure they get good care. Mm. So they, so for example, in the United Kingdom, we we produced a document a few years ago uh, called Safe Care in Hospital. What care to expect when you're in hospital? Yeah, because cause patients it, don't know what good looks like. Exactly. So it empowers that individual to say, well, actually, I've seen this. Are you able to, are you sure you're doing all the right things? And actually it challenges the health, the caregivers to say, oh, we should be doing differently and getting somebody who maybe knows what they're doing to come and help improve the care for that person received. So absolutely patient advocacy groups, people themselves with diabetes absolutely should be out there knowing about that this document is that's it's out there to help them. Well, you've all done a fantastic job. Thank you so much. And that's it uh, from this session of EASD TV, but there's much more to come very soon. Bye for now.